These six wines are from 2018, Margaret River's greatest ever Cabernet vintage. And at least four of these producers believe that this is the greatest wine that they have ever made. And the critics agreed. So let's see four years on whether or not those wines live up to the hype. And look who I've got here to help me, JJ. Welcome. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I am really grateful for the offer to get a chance to run through these again. I haven't looked at them in some time. I loved them at the time. Don't tell her and she can find out later on, but I reckon they're even better than I remember them as. I reckon these are fantastic. They've settled. They're, they're beautiful. They're more They've placid. They've settled. Yeah, yeah, relaxed. They're yeah. amazing, yeah. Uh, I really agree. Good word. Um, so but how I would like to start this is by saying that Margaret River in 2020 20, produced 1.6%, so 1 60th. 1.6% of Australia's Cabernet Sauvignon, and the whole of Western Australia produced 2.1%. In, in the capital city wine show circuit, where nearly all the judges are from the eastern states and the eastern states winemakers and wine writers, and the wines are masked, no one knows what they're, what they're tasting. Since the first show in 2014 till the last show last year in 2021, Margaret River has won, or Western Australia has won exactly 80%, that's 41 of 51, of the best Cabernet Sauvignon trophies. Truly extraordinary, but it shows the quality of the fruit, the quality of the clones, the quality of the vintages that have been coming out of Margaret River, in my opinion. And it does, it is all about that. It's about the confluence and the meeting of site, vintage, producer, um, and all of those overlays have to be right. And I think when we look at Margaret River, just as a, just before we get into the wines, when we look at Margaret River as a region, the two key varieties, obviously, are Chardonnay and Cabernet. And I think that stylistically, Margaret River has found its kind of place with Chardonnay. And I think that's got a lot to do with the ginger clone, very low yielding, very powerful, high acid. But it creates a certain type of wine. So winemakers can do a lot to it, but it, its essence remains very much Margaret River and Gingin. When it comes to Cabernet, um, there are two clones that predominate in Margaret River. One is the, um, the Horton selection, and the other is um, SA126, which is the South Australian clone. And they, are ve they perform very differently, and I think the sites are very particular when it comes to Cabernet. So actually, while Chardonnay and Cabernet are the two key varieties in the region, um, Cabernet may prove to be a little more difficult to get absolutely perfectly right, um, which is why these six producers um, routinely come up with wonderful wines every vintage. I think site has a lot to do with it, as does maker. Um, let's talk a little bit about 2018 as a vintage. You look perplexed. No, just before you do, I think I'm correct in saying all of these are used the Horton clone. Yes. Yeah, or the Horton selection. As yeah, thank, oh, sorry, routinely thank you. Thanks, corrected correct. <laughs> by winemakers. Yeah. Um, so 2018 has produced wines that when we look at verticals from producers, the 2018 wine, whether it's Cabernet or Chardonnay, is very powerful. And the vintage was ripe and warm, but it was without incident and without problem. There was very little disease pressure. Birds were really happy and therefore not pecking at the fruit because there was a really great marry blossom that year. So they weren't worried about what was happening in the vineyards. They were kind of eating in the trees. So there was all of these really good things that happened um, in the weather and the climate that contributed to um, the really gorgeous long season that occurred there. And the wines have been excellent. So when they were released, many of the wines were among the, the greatest reviewed ever, I would say, and that's not something that I follow as closely as you do, um, but certainly on my page, um, I was astounded by the quality of Cabernet and Chardonnay that came out of Margaret River from 18. So a number of these, I mean, the Tom Cullody is still current release. The Woodland Xavier is still current release. Yes. Um, and the rest of them were up to 19, 20, 19... 20, right? Okay, so a couple of them have... A 20 of this is coming out in, a, in, um, in about a month. Yeah, yeah. so they've so been 19, eclipsed yeah. by current vintages. So it's really nice to look back at them. So, John, let's start with the 2018 Vass Felix Tom Cullity in yeah. the left-hand glass. Yeah. So um, we saw this 18 months ago. I think that was the yeah. first time that we yeah. saw this. Yeah. And and the way that Vass Felix released is they released the Phileas and the Premier Cab 
um, a year before the Tom Cullody. So you kind of get this insight into the vintage via those two wines. And when they came out, I remember thinking, wow, they're really, I mean, the fruit is really kind of rippling and powerful. They're supple, red fruited. They've got thrust and drive and they're exciting. And so when the Tom Cullody came out, I kind of knew it was going to be great, but it was far better and more complex and more laid and fresher and, and more exciting than I had expected, even from those great earlier two Cabernets. And greater length. Yeah. Okay, so Virginia Wilcock and her team, because it's, it's, it's not a one-person job, um, have all, in almost all years since the mid-2000s just got better and better and better in both Chardonnay and in Cabernets. And um, uh, I asked, she was doing an enormous amount of experimentation with the very expensive wines, which then all the layers coming down through the price ranges were getting the benefits from. So the, the wines were getting better and better and better. The Up until 2012, it was called the Hatesbury Cabernet. 2013, the first Tom Cullody. It was a revelation. It was fantastic. Right. wasn't a warm vintage, cooler, but fresher, more appealing vintage. You and I, I think, both loved it, and I loved it at the time, thought it was the best red that they'd made so far. The 14 was better. 14 was my favourite, and the 13 is better now than it was then. And then the 15 came out again. Yeah. Um, wasn't If you talk to Vanya Cullen, she says it wasn't a cool vintage, but it came across as being a cooler style of wine. Delicious again. The the cooler vintages, I think, out of Vast Felix are drinking better earlier. The 14, 16, 18 will need a touch more time, I think. Then the 17, the 16, the 17, then the 18 came. The, each of the others almost in line. I've said that they were improving year by year. This is the best wine. Mm. This is the culmination of all of that. This is the best wine that I've ever made so far. And in my opinion, and don't worry, I'm used to making big statements. I put this in the best four or five Cabernet Sauvignons ever made in Margaret River. I love this wine. I've bought a lot of it for myself. And despite the fact that it's priced and it's close to $200, I think this is a great wine and will prove to be a great Margaret River wine over time. I couldn't agree more. Um, and the thing that I really like about this wine and the thing that I really like about each of these producers is they have a very clear house style. And Vas Felix house style is quite savoury. So she makes wines that Virginia and her team make wines that are layered and complex and savoury. They're not, they're not sweetly, I mean, they've got sweet, fresh fruit, but they're not sweetly fruited, fruit-driven wines. They've got so much complexity around um, tannin structure and flavours. I mean, I get a very maritime vibe off this wine. So it gives like kelp and nori and there's iodine and ferrous and rust and it's a little bit bloody today, which I like. It's a little bit salty. There's raspberry and licorice and star anise. It's exotic. Uh, but they're really fresh. And I think that right now um, you could easily and with pleasure drink the 18 Tom Cullody. But I just know looking at the trajectory of the 14, which is probably my favourite Tom Cullody, um, that thing has just got so long to go that I feel like unless you've bought lots of the, the 18, you should probably just sit on it a little while longer. I agree. Mm. Um, you don't have to look queryingly at me, I agree. But at the same time, I'm a retailer and restaurateur. I don't have time to put them down for my customers. And just to add to what Erin said, my view is, my customer's view is if I say, if people come in from the Eastern States, I want them to see the best of West Australia. So even if I lose a few dollars, don't tell my wife. <laughs> um, I'll open up a series of, um, of cross-section of West Australia's greatest cabinets, gas them up so I can use them later on, and just pour them to show them. They love this every time. I'm just, they love this wine. Beautiful, chewy, soft tannins. Yeah, yeah. Um, moving into the second glass. This is the 2018 Deepwoods Reserve Cabernet Sauvignon. So this one is the cheapest. And I always start with that because I think it's a really important point. I mean, this wine is $80. Yeah. Is 80 bucks. Um, yeah, I hadn't thought about that, but man. Which makes it very good value for money when you're talking about premium wines. I mean, it's laughable if you're talking about European wines. As an Australian, it's very expensive to buy European wines here. Um, so for $80 um, to access one of Market River's great Cabernet Sauvignons is a, is a real... It's a real treat, really. Um, so it's a very different style of wine. So where the, where the Vas Felix is, as I said, kind of maritime and and kelpy and norin iodine and all of that, this is much more um, succulent in, in its fruit profile. It's got bigger kind of more muscly tannins and it's got really nice flow. And I think on an international stage, the Deepwoods Cabernet is probably a more classical Cabernet Sauvignon. It's, it's richer and, and bigger and the vineyard is a little bit further north, although I don't know that that's 
all of the answer, but it's it's just a different style and it's drinking really well. It's very mouth feeling. Yeah, clash. I agree totally. Mm. Okay, so um, Deep Woods. Um, in 2012, they won all sorts of trophies and golds. I think they uh, they won about nine or ten trophies and seven or eight golds in a calendar year. Thirteen wasn't far behind. Um, they picked up four best cabinet trophies at Melbourne in a row, two out of three best cabinet trophies at Adelaide. and um, The 14 Jimmy Watson. Correct. <laughs> For the 14 vintage. Correct. And, the, um, and this one, Julian, who makes wine for a lot of people that win a lot of gold medal and trophies, says this is the best Cabernet he's ever made. Um, when it first came out, I bought and sold a lot of it. I thought it was a very, very good wine and great value for money. But today, this is a different beast. Um, it's better, hey? I Absolutely. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> it's gent- I, I just have slightly different use of words to you, as we both understand. Softer, gentler, plusher, longer, but not too big. Still restrained. Um, it, it's no big, porty, overripe, none of that sort of stuff. It, and it's not elegant, but moving to that way, seamless, finely textured, beautiful. It's much better than I ever could have hoped for. This second wine, the Deep Woods, that is a really good wine. Julian, you've done a great job. I feel like when that wine's released, it's kind of like a, when a bird puffs up all of its feathers and it's oh, kind of like big okay, and inflated. Yeah. And now yeah. everything's just settled in <laughs> and closed in and it's, it's more complete now. Uh, you know? <laughs> how do you do it? <laughs> it's true though. <laughs> I agree totally, but I've never heard that in relation to a wine. But I agree totally, yep. Um, moving into the third wine, the 2018 Mosswood Cabernet Sauvignon. So... Um, this, I mean, it's very clear to me when you put this in your mouth, both when it was released and now, the length of flavour and the structure and everything about it is just, it's just wonderful. Everything is in place. Um, and I can't help thinking back to two other vintages of Mosswood that I really love, and that's 05 and 01. And I think, um, you know, as, I, as time goes on, I'm not sure if that's a fair comparison because I'm looking, thinking of those wines and how they taste now. And I love the flow and the kind of, they've got like a mellifluous sort of thing about them. You know, they're just beautiful, elegant, gorgeous wines. And this isn't there yet because it's got so much life and kind of energy and it will get there. And whether or not it will be better than those wines in time, I don't know. I believe it. there's a very good chance that it will do. Um, but it's just, I feel like we drink, we get the pleasure of drinking quite a bit of old Mosswood Um in Western Australia, it's been at the heart of, of many collectors for many years and people have great pride in bringing those wines out. So it's a joy to drink them. And wines from the late 70s and early 80s are still drinking beautifully now. As long It's really just a cork issue. If the cork held in, the wine is beautiful. They're incredible. So we can only assume that now, given all of the advancements in like technology, Picking data. I mean, Keith is really amazing with his data. Um, oh yes. Building. So you can only assume that these wines are getting better and better and better. Um, but I did like the five and one very much. Okay. So following Aaron's point, Keith Mugford at Mosswood has a weather station on the property, and he follows it like no one else. And he relies on the information to work out what he's going to do in the coming vin- vintage. He predicts what's happening usually correctly. So. It's working, and he's getting great benefit from it. Um, Mosswood, vintage first vines planted in 1969. So I don't know if you were there or not. In 69? Uh, it, but in um, four or five years ago, Paul Holmes Court at Vast Felix hosted a tasting um, for, I think, was it the, 40th, the 50th anniversary? 50th, I was there, yeah, yeah. And, and Peter Forrestall, who founded Australian Gourmet Traveller Wine um, and was the Western Australian wine writer, among many other things in our industry, um, brought along a 1973, four years old at the time, 40 years later, and a 1975. 50 years later. 40? 50, 50, 50 years no, later. No, oh. you're right. Sorry. <laughs> I, I don't mind. <laughs> I'm often wrong. Erin corrects me and saves me, usually. So um, um, the wines were still staggeringly good. Then we move ahead, I agree totally, and Keith Mugford, the owner-operator of, of Mosswood with his wife, and now his family, agree totally. They believe 2001 and 2005 were the great vintages up until then. And then despite all the increases in technology, all the, the better use of oak, the better learning and understanding of the vineyards, they thought that it took till 2018, this wine, to make a better wine than 2001 and 2005. Um, I love this wine on a, also on arrival. I mentioned the Deepwoods. Um, this 
today is exquisite. I am thrilled with how these wines have developed. I want to tell you that Mosswood is WA's favourite $100 plus Cabernet Sauvignon. It may be in the country, I don't know. As I said earlier, we've got retail res retail stores and, and restaurants. I can buy at over $100 a bottle of retail, a hundred dozen of that instantly, knowing I can sell every case because the consumers want it. The Western Australian consumers love it because it's so fine, so textural. The tannins are normally, while well, present, subliminal, not to the level of Mount Mary in Victoria, which Erin and I both love, um, but they're absolutely wonderful. The customers come from everywhere to buy Mosswood. I, with all of these, and Erin and I know all of these, these guys are amongst our better friends, so I don't want to insult anyone, but I'm telling you, these guys have won the, pub, the popular vote. Everybody loves Mosswood, and we should add that in 2016 vintage, I think um, that was James Halliday's Cabernet Sauvignon of the year, and just for the record, the 2017 vintage was James Halliday's Chardonnay of the year. Don't overlook these guys. This is a delicious wine, it's and it's surprised me about how good it is. I think um, I, when I first started drinking Mosswood, I thought the new vintages, I thought that they were going to be much bigger than they were. I don't think that the big, bolshy wine, um, the, the fruit is really red-fruited and supple and very elegant um and they it's they're all medium bodied wines it's it's really just about what flavors they encase within that and the shape of the tannins that they that they build around the fruit i think red fruited yeah i agree totally Important. to the level that a couple of eastern states critics have criticized keith for that i personally am totally for it and it sounds like you are too yeah i, I love, love the flavors love the characters and this as of now I'm on record for the first time as saying that is clearly better than the 01 and the 05, and I thought they were great wines. Mm. Yeah, that is good. Um, moving into the fourth wine, this is the 2018 Cullen Diana Madeline. So um, this is the biggest chameleon wine on the table for me, and it really depends day to day, week to week, month to month, how they look. And um, that kind of unpredictability and magic is sort of what makes me a little... Um, excited to open a bottle of DM, I have to tell you, because it's, I'm, I never know if it's going to be like the greatest, most exciting wine I've ever had, or if it's going to be one that I go, damn it, I should have waited a little while longer. Um, so the 2018 is definitely one of those beasts. I think it's got to do with the biodynamic thing to um, myself. I'm, I'm, I always I'm check listening. the calendar when I drink my wines. And I, uh, no matter yeah. what you think about the biodynamic cal calendar, you try Cullen's wines on given days. You start to they believe. Make it, yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, okay, so for this one. I haven't uh, checked today. Another right. You talk. I'll check. <laughs> um, so, um, Vanya Cullen is an extraordinary winemaker. I reckon she's one of the, one of the two great winemakers in Australia today. Um, the 2012 and 2015 vintages of her Vanya Cabernet Sauvignon were both Halliday's um, Cabernet Sauvignons of the year, 99 points each. Several times, even in recent years, Vanya has picked up James Halliday's Cabernet and Family um, Wine of the Year with this wine, with the Dana Madeline, and then. Um, uh, in 2018, Ray Jordan in the West is our most ubiquitous and best and most influential wine writer. Uh, this was Ray's Cabernet, or wine, Cabernet of the Year, Red Wine of the Year and Wine of the Year in about 2020, um, and deservedly so. And um, so great pedigree. Many people would say the greatest under this label to date, despite a number of the wines in the past being Halliday's a Cabernet Family Blend of the Year, a wonderful wine again. Uh, just add, if I can, that Vanya, it does make any difference whether it's with her Chardonnays or not, which are also amongst Australia's very best, um, whether it's the Chardonnays, what, whatever she does, the flavour is packed into every unit of juice. There's more flavour and complexity. I won't say richness because that's the wrong word. Um, in there, just full of flavours and textures, same as this one. This has just... I reckon it's got something to do with the fact that she doesn't use a lot of new oak. And so the wines aren't hidden in any way. Like they are really pure. And the tannin, especially in the Cabernet, the tannin that's in there is built largely in the vineyard. And so you get this really beautiful ductile, pliable, kind of bendy, flexible sort of tannin in the mouth, which makes for really delicious drinking. It is a fruit day. Um, and the thing that And I, that means? Well, just that um, the sap is high or low in the plant and it, it's about the energy and the moon. And But is the wine going to taste better? Thank you. Yes. 
Yeah, fruit days, yes. Root days, not as much. Do other jobs on root days, not tasting if you can. Um, the thing that I love about this wine, like I really love about this wine, is you get kind of black tea and graphite and tobacco leaf and bay leaf and salt bush and there's licorice and star anise. It's kind of an exotic wine and an intriguing wine and a delicious wine and it's built in a medium-bodied frame. And like I say, those tannins that are just kind of like woven through it, it's a really... It's a, it's, a, it's a wine that is <clears throat> at, at once very specific to site and place. It's very, very, very Margaret River and, and very much her vineyard, but it's also a really great wine on the world stage because it's really expressive and awesome. It talks about Cabernet and it talks about tannin and it talks about fruit. It's really an impressive wine in every sense and I just, yeah, love it, obviously. Okay, and Vanya's just come back from Europe where she was hosting a whole series of tastings. Um, for the launch of the new vintages over there. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, really good. Um, in the fourth glass is the Zanazu 2018 Reserve Cabernet Sauvignon. So Fifth. Fifth. Good job. In the fifth yeah. glass um, is the Zanadu 2018 Reserve Cabernet Sauvignon. And we just recently did a very big um, series of verticals down at Zanadu with winemaker Glenn Goodall, Halliday's winemaker of the year this year and um, Brennan Carr. And we went back to 2007 or 2008 across Reserve, Stevens Road, Black Label, both Chardonnay and Cabernet, so six verticals. And what was clear to me was the 2018 vintage in every instance was easily the most powerful and the most driven. Now, when this wine was released, I believed that it was the greatest wine red or white made at Xanadu. And I do believe that but it comes with a small qualification and that is you can't overlook the 14 and you can't overlook the 11 Stevens Road because those two wines are just ridiculous they are magical wines Stevens Road 2011 Halliday's yes highest pointed Cabernet Sauvignon at the time ever 99 points the texture of that wine is ridiculous it is so beautiful um and 14 my favorite vintage of course I have one magnum left. I mean, I shouldn't have said that. You shouldn't that. say that. That's really, it's really hard to get that wine. I mean, it's it's sold out off the back of that Halliday Award at the time. It would have been in 2013, I suppose. Um, so it's been very difficult. If you weren't around at that time, you weren't buying it. Well, you kind of will have trouble, except if you get it from JJ. So um, the thing about they won't get mine. Good. The thing about Xanadu is that. Um, uh, these are very, very pure wines, I would say. The Reserve has got other varieties in it. I think Petit Verdot and Malbec from memory. Um, so it's got slightly more density and muscle than the Stevens Road, which is 100% Cabernet Sauvignon. And you can choose stylistically which you prefer. Um, but it's all about texture for me in this wine. It's both fine and, and focused at the same time. Okay, so I've been around a long time. So John Lagan, who founded these vineyards, I reckon, I'm hearing different stories these days, but at the time I used to see quite a bit of John. I used to see him once or twice a week for, for many years. He told me that they bought the blocks that this came off, uh, that this comes off in 1967 and 1969. He told me that he bought them for 35 and $45 an acre, depending on which year it was, and today they'd be worth... Twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars per acre, um, and um, and then the wines were very good, but they only came into their own after Glenn Goodall, who had been working there for some years previously, took over as senior winemaker with his team, Brendan Carr and others, and because it's always a team effort in winemaking, um, and then the wines have become better and better and better. And Erin and I talk about these sort of things quite a bit, but at the um, at the capital city. At, at the Canberra, at National and Senior Wine Show, Xanadu have now won eight consecutive Best Cabernet Trophies. Now, all those wines are masked. They're all Eastern States judges. How could anybody, just on rules of chance, um, pick up eight consecutive Best Cabernets and nine out of the last ten? It is beyond belief. Xanadu are doing a great job. Um, I'll, yep. I'll just add to that. In a wine show, it can be easy to get a gold because you just need someone to stand up for your wine and say, no, I really love it. 
in the in the um and you do a lot of judging seven or eight shows a year correct yeah. yeah so it's it is easy enough for a winery to get a gold you just need one judge to say stand on their haunches and say i really love that wine it's far more challenging to get a trophy because the field just keeps getting narrower and narrower and narrower and it gets put against better and better and better wine so it has to beat every wine at every stage it's not just beating one wine here and one and it gets a trophy it's like you beat 50 wines to get a gold and then you have to be elected the top gold and then you have to beat all of the other top golds in that class and then you get put forward onto the trophy table and then you get tasted off against all of the other top golds in the show so actually um it's a really big deal to get a trophy it's not a simple thing so that's what makes it so amazing that they've got this trophy so many times in a row it's like mind-boggling uh, beyond belief yeah Inex inexplicable. Now, I'll add to that, though, um, because not only that, Xanadu do not enter in the Hobart Wine Show, so they only enter six shows a year. In the, in the, out of all of the Capital City Wine Shows since 2014, Xanadu have won 30% of the best Cabernet trophies on the Capital City Wine Show circuit. Again, Inexplic inexplicable and beyond belief. I want to add, and I didn't say it earlier when we were talking about Deep Woods, and Peter Fogarty, who owns and operates this place with, un with the senior winemaker, Julian Langworthy, um, these guys, since 2014, have won 21% of the best Cabernet trophy since the first show in 2014, which means that these two between them, Xanadu and Deep Woods, on their own, from... West, from Margaret Rivers, 1.6% of Australia's Cabernet Sauvignon have won 51% of the best Cabernet trophies in that period. It, it can't be done, but it's happened. It's truly extraordinary, it, but it's testament to how good Margaret River Cabernet Sauvignon is in the eyes of Eastern States wine writers and Eastern States show judges. Truly extraordinary, great effort. Um, something to, to add, which is not written down anywhere, but an interesting thing to note, um, is that I would say that Woodlands, Cullen, Mosswood, Vass, Felix and Lewin are Margaret River's kind of top top tier producers, right? They're the blue bloods. And then you've got this little rising set of producers below them, Deepwoods, Xanadu, Stella Bella and a couple of others. McHenry Honan. McHenry yep. Honan that are rising up through the ranks. And it's it's now this is where it's contentious, right? But I believe that the fortunes of Xanadu and Deepwoods are largely built on the skill of two great winemakers that have headed up two great teams, right? And Julian Langworthy and Glenn Goodall and their teams have been the foundation of success that these producers are seeing in the last decade or more. Now, whether um, what the next transition of winemaker will look like, we don't know, and we hope that these two guys never leave these two estates, but, uh, you know, life happens. For me, that's a very, very interesting thing to consider. I think about it often when I'm looking at this kind of, because these are no question pedigree producers. It's it's just, I guess, the building blocks of how they got there that I, f I find quite interesting. So anyway. Oh, can I come in here? Yeah, then? yeah, right. yeah. So at this stage, with the wines that we're looking at here, the Tom Cully is a little bit more structured. The Dona Madeline is a little bit more structured. We haven't got to the woodlands yet, a little bit more structured. Xanadu, uh, but, and the softer, plusher, gentler style of the deep woods and the moss wood. With the Xanadu, there's two things, in my opinion. The first one is that um, they're changing style, in my opinion only. I haven't talked to Glenn about it. The Glenn got all the senior winemaker. Um, he and Brendan. I haven't spoken to them about it, but to me, there is less uh, phenolic or tannic st tannin structuring. I'm assuming oak, but they know more about those, sort of, and you might know far more about those sort of things than I do. So these are more appealing early. They used to, both the Chardonnays and the Cabernets used to take a bit of time to show their best. With a few years, they were stunning. They were great wines. With a few years, they are great wines. I am proud to show them to international visitors, but they need a little bit of time. In this instance, this is delicious early. The fruit's forward. The tannins are a touch softer, and I really like it. The only other thing I do want to add... And, and Aaron and I do talk about these things from time to time. The amount of work and experimentation and the thought processes behind the oak selection and oak usage in wineries is extraordinary. The guys at Xanadu, along with the guys from Lewin Estate, 
I have never heard of or seen people being able to talk for hours, literally hours, about why they selected certain barrels and what impact they have and then what flavours they want to get to and then add into this blend and this blend and this blend from this barrel and this barrel and this barrel. It's extraordinary, but they're getting the results. Mm. Truly amazing. Wins. Oh, really? Wins are another producer that I did not know that. Yeah, okay, yeah. But Sarah I'm not Pigeon. spending time over there now. Sarah Pigeon, um, she's awesome. My family are largely from Coonawarra. Oh, sorry, from Mount Gambia, just south of Coonawarra in South Australia, and I didn't know that. Thanks. She's great. Um, so moving into the final glass, this is the 2018 Woodlands Xavier, and I feel like this little producer, so, so in terms of north to south, and this is going to test me, but we've got north yelling up, deep woods in yelling up, and you come down Caves Road and you get to Mosswood first, and then you've got Woodlands, Cullen, Vast Felix and Zana doing Walcliffe, correct? Or Butchered Up? Yes, but I want to clarify something, or I'm asking no, your view. Yeah, yeah. Does all, of, nearly all the fruit of this comes from some, the main block. Correct, and okay. some comes from Treaton, I think. Okay, like th thank yeah. you very much. Or at yeah, least thanks. it used to. Thank you, yep. Um, Woodlands make a very specific style of Cabernet Sauvignon, and I feel like they get slayed in the press a bit because they're very oaky on release, and these wines are very heavily oaked. And right now, when you smell it, it's good. It's really good quality oak. It's high quality. It's like it's got a biscuity kind of soft, gently oatmeal-y character. It's a little bit kind of resinous. Um, there's some cigar box. It's really, I mean, we're just talking about the oak characters there. But the fruit's really powerful. And these wines age beautifully. And I think in Western Australia, again, we get to see a lot of these wines as old wines because people collect them and they bring them out for a dinner or an event of some description. So... I feel like I look at the Woodlands wines with a little bit of um, affection, knowing how nicely they evolve into old age. So when I saw the 2018 Cabernet, you kind of see the oak, but you have to you have to put it aside because when we drink Bordeaux, we always drink it early and go, oh, you know, you can't drink Bordeaux in the first 10 years. It's because it's oaky. So you put the oak aside and you look at the fruit and you say that's an excellent wine. Woodlands, I feel, are, are like that. I, I actually... Um, like Cabernet at every age but with Woodlands I think that you're better to just um, bank the cellar and start drinking them at sort of five or six or seven years of age because you see the fruit's really good quality so you still get the primary fruit at that time but the oak has really melted into the fruit and you get a more complete view of what the wine can be so I gave this wine 98 points in the companion I just think it's an exceptional world wine this is a cellar wine um, the James Halliday wine companion absolutely yep um, I think I went 98, 98. I didn't have the benefit of reviewing that, but would have gone there, 98, 97, 99. Um, but with this wine, I just see, I see the oak. So if you open it and go, oh, it's pretty oaky, I see that and I'm not looking at it. I'm looking at the fruit and the fruit is awesome. The fruit is exceptional and this will go for decades and decades. Okay, so um, everybody uh, looks at wines, in my opinion, um, for different reasons and chooses wines for different reasons. Um, we talk about the fact that often if you put six great wines on a table and you had 10 people in the room, you'd probably have all six wines chosen by someone, at least someone has the best wine in the room. I see and use the example of some of the greatest English speaking wine writers on Burgundy having polar opposite views on exactly the same wines from the same vintages. Um, everyone's got their own views. Um, in this instance, um, Woodlands, um, uh, in my opinion, have great length. Also, this wine has great length. My view is I give points. I prefer wines of enormous length. I know they're going to age well. And the finished and aftertaste on this, and I'm I'm very aware of all that you're saying, finished and aftertaste, I reckon, are delicious. I had that with a meal now with food. It'll be wonderful, but 10 or 15 years from now, be even better. So they've got a fantastic block just across the road from Moss Wood, also fantastic quality fruit, great fruit, and then not only have they made all the wines themselves, they've sold fruit off to other people over the years uh, before Stuart and his younger brother Andrew came back in and took over the winemaking. Other wineries also won trophy after trophy after trophy after trophy after trophy, champion wines at Sydney, that sort of stuff, um, from the fruit off their block. Absolutely extraordinary. They've then, when Stuart came home and started making marvellous wines, 2004, I thought was the Cabernet of the vintage in Margaret River, and they believe it's one of the, well, I think I do believe it's probably their great vintage. Um, interesting point, Cullens and Mosswood believe 2001 and 2005 were the best vintages of that decade. Um, 
Woodland and Horton. Uh, Adam, the 2004 was the best finish. The 2004 Margaret <laughs> is so good. I haven't I tried have, it recently. It is so good. I have a magnum of that. I found it somewhere. It was $45 or something outrageous. A magnum. She keeps Ridiculous. making ones out that I don't get to see and then just so dropping good. it in casually. So good. I'll open it one day when we <laughs> drink. <laughs> so good. I can think of a good occasion. Uh, uh, the um, So I reckon Woodlands are just getting... I wouldn't say the, well, they probably are getting better and better. Uh, the 2016, I think, um, Clementine Eloise was Ray Jordan, mm. that prominent West Australian wine writer. His uh, wine of the year for Western Australia or Cabernet Sauvignon of the year, I'm not sure which or both or maybe both. Um, but I love the wines for the reasons that Erin said, but then with that added length of flavour. The length of flavour on each of these is extraordinary. The texture and seamless feel from mid palate through to the lingering finish in each of these is better than anything I could have hoped for. These are truly great wines and I'm really grateful that you came up with this idea. Yeah, I'm very pleased and I, th I think that Margaret River's superpower when it comes to Cabernet Sauvignon is the tannin profile because the wines are not, firstly they're not big wines, they're not rich, heavy, dense, full-bodied Cabernets, they're medium weight, supple, fresh pliable, spicy, sometimes herbal cabernets. Um, but it's the tannins that really, really define that. And I think it's got to do with the blend of clone and sight, as we were talking before. Forget the makers, forget the styles, it's fruit and sight. And <clears throat> those tannins are like a web inside the fruit. It's not like something that encases the wine that you have to wait for it to sink in. That's an oak situation. The tannins are really like threaded through the fruit and I've often spoken before about tannins and fruit being a similar thing to like steak with um, marbled fat you know what I mean it's webbed through everywhere but as soon as you cook it it melts into the fruit into the into the flesh well it's similar here um, and I just I'm really kind of thrilled to see these wines at this stage I think for me on all of them the oak is sitting above the fruit at the moment because the fruit goes through periods of undulation it, it will be ripe and ready to drink at one point and then it goes down into a quiet phase and it comes back up and um, we see that we see that um concept brought to life with Dom Perignon and they have the P2 P3 that's a plenitude situation and they say at this point when we release the P2 it is now ready to drink for a second time well these cabernets go through that same waveform but we don't release them or re-release them um, for me, at the moment, the fruit has gone into a quiet phase and the structure has come out, all except the deep woods where the fruit has still, is still kind of blossoming. Um, and I think for me that when we look at these wines again in five years, they're still going to look really primary and awesome, um, but they're, the, the structure and the oak is really going to have sunk into the fruit. So that's my prediction and we'll look at that again in 2026. Seven, so, seven, 20, 27. So do you reckon this has illustrated that these, the 2018 vintage as good as you initially hoped? Yes, because while 19 was cooler and produced wines with graphite and poise and detail and, and um, aromatics, they're beautiful wines to drink now and, and they'll age, no question. But these are really the pedigree cellaring wines and that's what I'm trying to look for because there's beautiful vintages all over you know, in the last decade, beautiful vintages all over. Um, 2022 is meant to be absolutely astounding from all that I've heard and seen, so I can't wait. That's still a year or two away before we're going to know anything about that. But, yeah, I really I really believe that these are the great pedigree cellaring wines and you're not going to get to 10 years' time and go, oh, she was wrong, they fell over, because I don't believe that they will. I believe that they've got 20, 30-plus years in them with, with ease. So Every one of these will live for 30 years yeah. without question. Yeah. That's demonstrably proved now. Mm. Um, and then um, cool. the 19 Diana Madeline and the 19 Xanadu are both delicious wines, um, but gee, it'll be hard put for them to beat these. And we understand by looking at the reviews that we see um, around Australia that some people love the 19s. These, I just don't see how, as a group, you could have a better group of Australian Cabernet Sauvignons. These have surprised me with their absolute quality. This is extraordinary. I'm so grateful. Me too. How cool. <laughs> <laughs>